Hi everyone, welcome to Bupers Academy. I'm Piers Linney. I'm your host today for this very exciting event. Now you all know, running a small business, that the market for talent is fiercely competitive. I'm always amazed the stats show that one in four employees are currently actively looking for other employment opportunities in the market. So there's the issue of finding talent, there's also the issue of retaining talent. And I know for my own businesses and businesses that I invest in, having a happy, healthy team is critical to the success of your business. What you may be surprised to hear is that one in six people are experiencing mental health problems in the workplace and mental ill health is remaining the most common cause of long-term absence. So it's really important that, that we all, especially those running small businesses and employers, proactively address the mental health issues our teams face, not only for them, but also to make sure your business is as successful as it possibly can be. We've certainly got a packed agenda today. We're going to cover the scale of the talent challenge, First, we'll be up asking Richard, Director of Small Business at Bupa and the panel, their thoughts on the current talent challenge and how a focus on wellbeing can help address this. Next is a customer case study. I'm going to be hearing from Julie, who's a Bupa customer. I'll be asking Julie about her experience of managing mental health within her own small business, what works and what doesn't. Then we're going to cover some practical tips on how to build a mental health strategy and how to manage risk. We'll be talking to Dr. Naomi. She's head of mental health and well-being at Bupa. We will share key things to consider when addressing mental health in your workplace. And we also have Jo, who's head of employment law at Slater and Gordon, which is a law firm, and she will outline the legal obligations you have as an employer. And lastly, we're going to answer your questions. We've had so many, we'll try and get through as many as we possibly can. So Richard, I'm going to come to you first. You and your team at Bupa, you're the head of small business at Bupa, yep. so you interact with small businesses every day. So just tell us, small businesses, what are they saying about the talent challenge? I know this myself, that there really is one in the market out there. And what role do you think that health and well-being, and what are the benefits in terms of embracing it that it can play in acquiring talent, but also retaining talent? Yeah, sure. So actually, firstly, I mean, the workplace has changed um, irrecognisably in the last two years from people expecting flexible working and being much more focused on the health after the pandemic. And, um, you know, pair that with the recruitment and retention uh, challenges that you've just uh, just articulated. Um, it, uh, it really comes together with, with employees demanding um, health and wellbeing uh, solutions and benefits. So, um, less of just uh, uh, medical insurance, but actually more how are, we gonna, um, how are you going to support me? Um, you're my, my employer, my, my home and work life is really getting mixed up now uh, because I'm working at home and I'm coming to the office occasionally and so on. Um, so that is manifesting itself for SMEs in needing to support their employees both physically and mentally. Um, and it might be with a digital solution or it might be um, somebody on the telephone, but employees are really expecting to be supported. So in small businesses, um, one of the big issues clearly is the small businesses. So if you've got, say, 10 employees, that's how you define it, and two are absent for some reason, um, you know, how, how does that impact your customers? And what are you trying to do? You know, what are the benefits of having a mental health plan in place to help reduce that risk? Yeah, sure. So I mean, we hear a lot from small businesses that losing you know, one person out of their business is, is a big impact on them. And also the person leading that business having to support them and help them you know, they want to be running their business, but they're very concerned about looking after their people as well. So we see our role as um, being able to step in at that point, offer the support, whether it be digitally or over the phone, um, in whatever ever way they want to access it so that we can help them get better as quickly as possible. And of course, early intervention is, is the key here. Um, as with any illness, if you can step in quickly and get things resolved quickly, then it makes a big difference. And what do you see the, uh, the benefits are in terms of, you know, obviously, you might think it's, it's obvious, but in terms of a small business, especially not a big corporate, you know, what are the benefits of putting these plans in place? Yeah, sure. So, um, I mean, everybody wants to access um, their care differently. And also with something like mental health, there's still quite a big stigma around it. So um, the benefit of having a plan in place and your employees knowing it's there is they can access care confidentially. Um, without you as the business even knowing, actually. Um, so you might even, as a business leader, never even know that your employee had a problem, but they were able to access the right care at the right time and get themselves better. And therefore, there's no impact on your business. You can continue on leading, running your business, and your employee gets the support that they need. I think that's key. I think there's this massive awareness of 
mental health, we're all aware of it in the market, you read about it every day, but in the workplace it can be a real stigma attached to it because you, you people often fear for the, for the job actually as well. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah. it's something that people really struggle with sometimes to open up with their, their boss essentially. Yeah, yeah, and that, you know, again, a, a very common thing that comes up a lot, you know, people are worried about sticking their hand up and saying they've got a problem. Yeah. Um, so um, as I say, we, you know, we very much see our role as being there, um, sitting in the background, but um, you know, the key is everyone being aware of it and all employees being aware of what they can access at the right time. I mean, my, I've got a business, uh, in a tech business, and I'm, I'm sort of started reasonably recently, and we have these conversations commonly now where mm. this never used to happen. And mm. they even had a, a, a developer that worked for us, and I was up in Glasgow, I went to meet him to sort of talk through his issues and try and understand them. And sometimes even it's still be quite difficult to mm. come to a solution. But I think it's something that employees and companies that I'm involved in is becoming a common conversation. So, Dr. Naomi, I'm going to come over to you. Um, obviously, you're working closely with small businesses too. And what are the, the most common mental health issues that you're seeing small businesses having to deal with? Yeah, so typically it's anxiety and depression as being the most common mental health problems that people are experiencing and they can range from the mild symptom right through to the severe symptoms of those conditions. We can find as well we have um, you know, existing problems with substance misuse for example because the problems have been there for quite a while with the person or eating problems. So there can be a range of different conditions within the, the anxiety and uh, depression that we see. Anxiety comes in various forms so it could be uh, the person person's experienced some form of trauma, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder is quite common, uh, health anxiety is quite a common one and social anxiety as well. Um, we also find that employees typically will use the word stress to refer to a, a plethora of different conditions actually because it feels more socially acceptable to say stress as opposed to anything else and like Richard said it's about the, um, the stigma that still exists unfortunately with regards to mental health. And I think finally what I would say is in terms of the work-related ill health side of things, employees when they have mental health problems will either directly link their mental health problems to the work and say work has created these mental health problems for me or they'll say that work is a contributory factor to my mental health problems or actually they'll say work has got absolutely nothing to do with my mental health problems and in fact work, work is quite helpful for me and it's nice to escape into work and forget about things for a bit and typically we will see that um, it's about work contributing to mental health problems more than anything else. So do you find it um, a difference between men and women? So I'm, I'm generalising now, so women might talk about anxiety and, and men's stress, do you find there's a different how they communicate between the sexes? I would say so, yes. If we were going to make a sweeping generalisation, I would say yes. Women are particularly more easy to sort of uh, express how they feel about things a lot of the time. It depends though the level of the woman in terms of the business. So if they are quite senior within that business, they may struggle to even express that they're struggling because of the, 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 uh, the gender you know uh, differences as well however um, yeah males typically it's the stress term and females it can be I'm feeling quite worried and anxious about things and, and what people do um, is called covering isn't it so yeah. they're, they're covering up yeah um, I, I did it myself when I was from against the city I was mm. I was covering up my accent mm. in many ways but mm. if you've got a mental health mm. issue mm. You, you people often cover it which is is stressful in itself yeah um, so it's quite for that reason it's quite hard to spot mm. so what are your sort of top tips in, in terms of you know, understanding and seeing as early signs? Yeah, so signs and symptoms would be changes in the habits, so how they um, behave in work, typically in some form or another. So what we find is mental health impacts on the way we engage and function on a day-to-day -day basis. So it might be that the person is thinking, feeling and behaving differently and they're involved in quite vicious cycles, quite self-sabotaging behaviours at work, not meaning to, but that's how it manifests. What we can find is, for example, the person is having more absence from work, so they are increasingly becoming more absent, and it's for a range of different reasons. It's not just necessarily for sickness absence, or I've got to look after my child today, and various uh, reasons for that. Then we've got things like the way they perform their role, so it can be making mistakes, uh, not meeting deadlines for whatever reason, keeping a quite a low profile and not really wanting to engage in, and talk to people and that will be quite unusual for them. Personality changes can be quite common and quite a significant indicator so someone who is um, irritable, uh, distractible, uh, 
aggressive even sometimes, you know, with the way they're communicating things, quite negative in their thinking, catastrophizing, always looking at the worst possible uh, situation in a situation that they've never really thought before. Um, and lastly, I would say, just on to the point about masking, people will often say, I am masking on a day-to-day -day basis my mental health problems. They have the mask firmly on. However, we do see subtle signs and subtle cues within that masking. Some people are very overt and it's very obvious something's not right, but a lot of the time people mask. And what I would say is finally about that is listen to the words that come out of someone's mouth. It can feel very obvious to say that, but actually the words they use, the how they refer to themselves, how they communicate, whether it's all very negative, that will say something about how much they're struggling at that moment in time. And what's interesting is this is not new. This has always been there almost, just the, the fact we're talking about it more now as well. Mm. And, and you as an employer, you, know, you have to sort of lean into this and understand it. Because if you get it wrong, or something goes wrong, or in some cases you know, drastically wrong, um, you potentially have a liability and a risk. Mm. Which we can be very neatly on to the lawyer in the room, another, another fellow lawyer. I'm a lawyer, lawyer by training myself. So, Joe, you're, you're an employment lawyer. It'd be great if you could just understand and let us understand and the risks involved in not having, not leaning into this and having a robust approach and putting in place some kind of mental health strategy in the workplace. Cases I see and the claims that I'm seeing which are on the rise, which are claims against employers by employees for not taking mental health seriously and because they've become unwell, um, they generally are from firms that have got fantastic and robust IT policies, but not particularly those for their human resources such as mental health. And I would say that if a business is not going to invest in a robust mental health policy, it's really putting itself at risk. Uh, if we agree that talent is our biggest asset as a business owner, then we really need to protect that talent. And we do so by having a robust approach in place. One, so that your staff know who to speak to and what to say. And two, so that managers know how to deal with an issue should it arise. So the other risk, of course, is to the business itself. Uh, and with the Equality Act, amongst other things, uh, if you don't take the welfare and mental health of your employees seriously, you put yourself at liability, both as a director of a business and corporately as a business itself. You're also going to damage your reputational risk if you have claims made against you. And we have a competition for talent, we all know that. Um, putting yourself out there as a firm that takes people's mental health seriously, particularly in this day and age, is, is a fantastic thing to do. It's the right thing to do and it's a benefit to the business. So I never knew myself that uh, a person's mental health can fall under equality? Yes, it that, does. That opens up a whole different sort of a, um, a whole range of potential risks to a business. Because people, people often think about mental health, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a softly, softly thing. Um, whereas actually, in terms of a business, you're talking about real legal liability. Well, the law bites. The law has teeth on mental health and disability. And it's called the Equality Act 2010. It's, it's the bread and butter for employment lawyers. Uh, it's a very robust piece of legislation and you'll see it cited frequently. Uh, it protects nine protected characteristics, one of which is mental health under, a, under the heading of disability. So if someone fulfills the definition of disability, which uh, roughly means you've had uh, a condition that affects your day-to-day -day life uh, and it's lasted for 12 months or more, they will fall into that remit. And does the employer need to know that or just, or they just should have The employer needs to have that. knowledge, but in some cases, you could de be deemed to have knowledge if an employee's been off in short bursts for a long period of time or you haven't really asked why that employee's off, you haven't kept in touch with your employee, uh, and they've had mental health issues, you're deemed to have known it, and that will, that, those, those laws do bite, and they'll come back to bite the employer. I never knew that myself, that's really interesting. Mm. Richard, I'm, I, in business, I'm always competing in the market for talent for large companies, and they're increasingly asking me, you know, <laughs> what have we got to offer them? And we have to find ways to differentiate. So in, in your experience, how important do you think it is to offer you know, mental health support to a team? And what do you think the, the benefits are of doing that? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, SMEs are asking us more and more for support with, uh, with mental health. And there are, there are two elements to this, firstly for the business and secondly for the employees. So for the business and the business owner, um, by buying uh, support for your employees, it really helps you manage them. It means you'll spend less time trying to support them yourselves. And we're the experts in that area, so we can really support. I think secondly for employees and particularly younger employees, I think there was a survey done recently, 90% of employees expect some sort of support with their mental health. Um, so it's becoming a demand as opposed to an expectation. 
And we're hearing more and more actually that um, when interviewing uh, and recruiting for, for new talent, um, it's becoming much more of a two-way interview with, uh, with prospective employees really asking what the benefits are um, of joining the business and not obviously just paying rations, but actually, you know, how are you going to support me with my health, um, flexible working, and mental health, and so on and so forth. So do you think that small business owners realise this? Um, yeah, I think they do. I mean, um, they're telling us that they're having to compete more and more with big business. Um, big businesses often have, you know, serious um, benefit plat uh, platforms in place and lots of benefits for their employees focused on mental health, health and well-being and various other areas. And it's quite difficult for SMEs to replicate that. Um, and we feel that we've got a lot to offer uh, for SMEs in that space where they can really offer their employees a, a similar sort of benefits package to help them recruit um, people into their business. And of course, for an SME, you know, one person missing is a large proportion of the workforce as opposed to a big business where it, you, know, you might be lost in the, in the numbers a little bit. Thanks, Richard. Now for our next session, earlier I caught up with Julie, who's been a Bupa customer for a couple of years, and I asked her about managing a mental health within her own small business. So let's go and see what she had to say. Hi, Julie. Thanks for joining me today at the Bupa Academy. So first things first, tell me a bit about your business. Hi, so I'm the CEO of IT Naturally. And IT Naturally is a really human-centric technology company. We were established about two years ago. We've got 30 people and we're growing all the time. We believe really strongly that any interaction we have is a human interaction. So whether we're working with our employees or with colleagues, we always keep that at the centre of our minds. And we think that's why we have a net promoter score of over 90 in an industry where it's normally between 40 and 50. That's a pretty amazing net promoter score. So we're both in the tech industry and I know how hard it is to uh, you know, hire people and retain people. So as a CEO of a small business, just explain to me what you see as a talent challenge in terms of recruiting and retaining people. So we re work really hard to attract the right people and we're very rarely interested in qualifications. We're interested, interested very much in people's attitude and their aptitude. And we want to get a really diverse workforce. We are very lucky, we have a loyal employee base, so we have very, very low turnover. And the people that we've got are very engaged in what we're doing. We invest very heavily in training and development um, and working closely with people. So it's refreshing to hear that although you're running an IT business, it's sort of people-centric, which means you need to invest in the people as well. And an important part of that is their mental health and well-being. So as a CEO of a small business, just tell me a bit about what well-being means in your business and what are the biggest challenges that both you, I guess, and also your team face in terms of their mental health. So COVID has been around nearly the whole time that we've been operational. We've had everybody working from home and that's caused many, many challenges for the team. A number of people have, well actually everybody at different times, has coped with, with mental health challenges. We've worked really hard at keeping communication with people. We've had a cameras on policy, so when people are talking to each other we can actually see people. We've put in weekly one-to-ones to ensure that every week the line manager just to checks in with people and finds out how they are. But when people have had a more serious mental health issue, we've tried very hard to listen, but also to signpost them to the professional help they can get. So it's great to hear that you've, you've thought about this and you've got some policies and procedures in place and it sounds like it's, it's part of your culture. So by providing mental health support though, do you think that's made a difference to your team and therefore your business? Absolutely. I mean, it's been a key part of our, our well-being, and we've trained one of our team as a mental health first aider and he's been able to support people. And he's been teaching us a lot about the stress bucket and how we all have a different stress bucket. And you keep putting things in and it gets fuller and fuller and fuller. And if you've got things that let the stress out, like maybe going for a, for a long walk, maybe chatting to a friend, then you're okay because your stress bucket, it all keeps moving. However, if you don't have any outlets and you keep putting stuff into your stress bucket, it overflows and that's when things go wrong. So we now use it a lot in the, in the company to say to each other, my stress bucket's full, I can't take any more. That's quite good actually, because you can, you can visualise that. One of the issues I see with mental health is that it's hard to understand and visualise it sometimes. I think that's really, it's really useful. And, and the thing that we love about it is it's, it's true of everybody. So you're not saying this person's got a mental health challenge and this person's got 
it's got good mental health. Actually, all of us have issues with our stress yeah, it's bucket. It's a spectrum, isn't it? That's the yeah. thing. It's not on or off. Exactly. Um, so, just so while we're talking about measuring mental health, which is so you know in the small business now, especially as we know, you know, costs are going up, the cost of hiring people is going up. You're getting squeezed. Mm -hmm. So, you did you try and quantify the benefit of your health and well-being support? And when you do that, do you think it helps you compete with larger enterprises competing for the same talent? We've never tried to quantify it. We put in Bupa, um full Bupa support on day one when we went live because that's what we believe. We want to support our companies, so we've, our people, so we've never ever looked for quantifiable benefits. We do actually have very low sickness levels and we're getting a little bit concerned about our low sickness levels because with the working from home culture, when people are saying, I'm a bit ill, but I'll work from home, we're actually trying to make sure that they're well enough to work, not accepting that everybody can work the whole time because they can work from home. That's great. It's interesting because we're looking at this, uh, mental ill health is one of the main reasons for absence from the workplace. So the mm -hmm. fact you're, you're seeing a benefit, but you're still checking that that's not for unintended reasons or unintended exactly. consequences, that's exactly. fantastic. So what practical initiatives do you, do you use to support your team's mental health? And does anything work particularly well, apart from the bucket? <laughs> so, like everybody now, we're hybrid working but we do ask everybody to come to the office a couple of days a week and we ask everybody in the team to come in on a Tuesday so that we have one day when everybody's together, they spend some time together, um, which has been really helpful. We also have a monthly sharing meeting. So last month at the sharing meeting, we covered two topics. We covered IT changes, which I as an IT person get quite excited about and doing it well is really important. But the other thing we covered was mental health. And one thing that came out from that discussion was grief and how we can support people better through grief and it's something that we hadn't really considered so it's something that we're trying to learn more about now. So it's fantastic that you, you've embedded this into your business um, and I've been through grief recently with my father and you know, I've never thought about that actually even something as simple as that in terms of embedding. So I think um, what I'm hearing from you is that it's made a real change to your culture, your ability to hire people yeah. and it sounds like retaining people as well given your net promoter score so I do want to thank you for sharing that today at the Bupa Academy. And uh, it was great to meet you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was really interesting hearing Julie's insights and experience. Now, we want you to participate. If you look on the right-hand side of your screen, we're going to run a poll and we have a question for you. And the question is, how would you rate the mental health support that you offer to your own employees? So please do get involved and join in and share your answer with all of us. Right, moving on to our next section, we're gonna dig into the, the practical tips, this is the important piece, that can help you build your own mental health strategy. So I'm gonna to go to Dr. Naomi. So there's a lot of information out there on you know, how to support people with mental health, it's quite confusing some of it. Um, but for business owners, this can be particularly overwhelming in terms of where you look, what resources do you use, and where do you start? So can you share, your, you're the expert in, in the room, can you share your top tips to consider when you're thinking about and actually going on to develop a mental health strategy for specifically a small business? Yeah, sure. So a great place to start for any employer is to organise and plan the mental health approach within policies and procedures within the company. Within the policies and procedures, there should be a reinforcement of open sharing. That is from the employee who's struggling. You know, we really encourage you to share things with us so that we can help you along the way. And also encouraging and reinforcing from those who are going to receive that information. You know, we want you to listen, we want you to learn. You know, mental health is, is not easy to understand from the person who's struggling with mental health and also the people who are there to try and help, even though that's not really their day-to-day -day job. So we're going to try and make it as simple as possible within these policies and procedures for everyone to understand where they stand and what they can do about it. I would say next it's all about, I suppose, encouraging open communication about mental health, which is vital on every level, really, in every different form. And I think to help here, it would be encouraging like training for team members or for managers to, to have the skills and to equip them with the knowledge and the awareness of mental health so that they can have that, those conversations and feel quite confident to have them. And then finally, I would say making it easy for people to access support and resources and tools. 
We've got a great website in the Mental Health Hub at Bupa. It's free, it's available to everyone to use and they'll find lots of different things there depending on obviously what the situation is. So I think a lot of small businesses, as you begin to grow as well, people they hear policies and procedures and they're sort of terrified of that, but to do this properly, mm. you do need to have some structure, don't you? Mm. You do need structure and there are lots of different uh, literatures out there actually about this actual uh, way about going about things. So there's an approach um, from uh, a thriving at work report, so it talks about the standards that you should have within your business and how you can go about each and every standard, uh, which, which is what they recommend, including policies and procedures and where to start. There's uh, work related action plans as well, so you can really structure that approach and do it in a methodical way within your business which feels uh, reasonable to start in a sort of a small way and then build up over time because it feels quite overwhelming and um, so there are uh, resources available out there. But it's even being aware that you have some kind of policy or procedure about, I mean you mentioned communication yeah. and that's to me the businesses I've been involved in that's the the key hurdle in many ways is just open up and make those channels of communication mm. sort of free and easy for everybody. Mm. It is, yeah, and it's a it's a vital part of that that policy really to say this is very, very important, how we communicate and how we receive that communication as well with regards to mental health. Richard, I'm gonna come over to you. And as Dr. Naomi said that you know signposting to support and resources like the the fantastic Bupa website she mentioned is really important. So can you remind us of the key support tools that people should be signposting their employees to? Yeah, sure, and it's really important as a starting point to recognise that you know mental health challenges are different for everybody and, and people have different ways of dealing with it. So, and we have three key areas or um, key ways you can, uh, can get into getting some help. So firstly, Silver Cloud, um, it's an app, digital based, um, service that you can go on, um, self-serve in effect and, and get some really good practical help. Um, secondly we've got our family mental health line that um, helps you deal with um, any type of mental health challenges that might be affecting your family whether it be your children right the way through to you know supporting your parents you know all um, big triggers of a, a mental health issue. And then finally um, you can call us up um, and we've got something called direct access. You don't need to go to your GP. You can ring us up, speak to one of our mental health nurses, um, and that would be the start of your journey. It might just be a conversation, or it might lead on to a consultation, um, and uh, you know, really good service with people who know exactly what they're talking about. And that can help reduce the barrier or the stigma they may feel to reaching out for help. Absolutely. The key is we make it really easy. Um, so whether it be you know digital access or ringing someone up, not having to go to you know book an appointment, see the GP, they grill you on why you want to see the GP, and so on. You're know, trying to remove that barrier so people can get into to get the help as quickly as they can. Now, Dr. Naomi, I think Rich was alluding to a really important uh, point there, which is you've got to build a culture that helps people feel comfortable about reaching out. So, what are your top tips on creating a culture like that? I think it is about psychological safety in the workplace and it's a key topic at the moment really how we do things around here and that comes from the leads and the, and the managers of a business to, to model what we expect. So culture is all about you know um, empathy as a leader, um, showing gratitude and appreciation for things, um, how we address failures, you know is it a safe place that we can learn from failure rather than it's a scapegoat exercise and things like that. So I think culture is, is a very significant thing within a business but it's hard to get to that point of everyone feeling that they can show up to work and be vulnerable and brave in equal measure. So it's about how we do that and we do it in small incremental steps for transformation in a business like that. I think also small businesses often they forget that you can't just let culture develop. It's something you've got to think about. What should it be? Yes. And you've got to try and create that and sort of uh, engender that and grow it over time. Uh, before we move on though, we're going to go to another, another poll. So if you look on the right hand side of your screen, you should see a, another question. And the question is, do you think your employees feel confident talking about their mental health with their line manager? So please do join in, get involved and share your answer on the right hand side of your screen there. So back to our panellists, and I'll come back to you again, Dr Naomi. So in a situation where somebody has had, they've taken time off due to a mental health issue, it's one of the key reasons for absence in the workplace at the moment, which has quite surprised me actually, I didn't know that. What advice would you give to employers 
in terms of that returning to work process? Yeah, it's a key one actually for me. It's something I hear about on a day-to-day -day basis as a mental health clinician. So I'm often supporting someone to return back to work after a period of absence. And I think it's a really vital opportunity for the employer to sit down with the person to understand how they're doing, what's been happening, has anything changed, and to express that the company are there to support them with that return to the workplace. I think one thing that is important here is thinking about that conversation as an important juncture to look at if there's anything more that the company can do as anything sort of needing to be adjusted in any way, shape and form for them within their role and for the person to be then feeling that they are going to have a smooth return to work rather than anything else. One thing I would say, because this is something that I see quite a bit, is not wanting to minimise what the person's just said in that discussion, because I can often hear that people have felt quite uh, devalued in some way or uh, invalidated by what they've just said to the employer, because what happens is the employer says, oh my goodness, thank goodness you're back. I'm, you know, I've got all these things that I want you to do here, and they feel quite overwhelmed and not heard and not listened to. They've been off with mental health problems. And I think the final thing I would say is don't expect that person to return to what you consider is your normal for them. Lots of things can happen when a person's been off work with mental health problems. For example, someone can have a, a different medication, they can be on medication for the first time, things could have uh, changed within their life, for example, their marriage might have broken up or it might be that um, they've had an epiphany and they've realised that work isn't that important to them anymore and actually they've been do, doing two late nights and they feel quite burnt out by the whole thing. So really checking in and finding out what is their new normal when they return to work. I think the key thing for me is, is it's not like breaking your leg, that you, know, you take six weeks off, they put it in the cast and you come back and you're the same person. Uh, things can recur, they can be more complicated, yeah. there are things that you don't see perhaps, so mm. you, it, it's, it's not the same as it, you need to really think about that. Yeah, yeah. Richard, I'm going to come over to you, this is one that uh, I can actually relate to. So it's lonely at the top, yeah. as I'm sure you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so how important is it for business owners to not only take care of their team's mental health, but to think about themselves? And I've had moments in my own career where I've had to think about this myself, um, you know, take a sort of inward look and talk to people uh, and do you see many claims for these people as well? Um, so uh, as a leader you can be going a million miles an hour you're trying to run your business look after your people probably look after your home life but well it's really it's really easy to forget about yourself um, and what you need to be able to function um, and we've talked a lot about uh, culture and communication and I think it's really important that um, we role model exactly what we expect with our employees and be really clear on communicating with them. So there's no point in telling them to do one thing and doing the opposite ourselves um, because we won't get the behaviour that we expect. So um, really simple things like uh, as a group um, agreeing what everybody's red lines are, understanding that a certain person wants to pick their children up at three o'clock on a Friday afternoon uh, and that's fine and all right and that's what they need um, to keep them fresh and happy and so on and so forth. Well, somebody else might want to go for a run at lunchtime each day. Um, that type of open communication um, is really, really important and a, an important prompt. So if you're the leader, often people struggle with showing what they might think is weakness, mm. you know, mental health or even physical health in some cases. So how does people help the, 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 the owner, the leader, um, reach out if they're not really that willing to do it, to reach out to their team? Yeah, so I think um, just because you're a leader, it doesn't mean uh, that you're always going to have amazing uh, mental health. So uh, I think we would support business leaders in the same way as employees. We have all those um, options to engage with us uh, and to get help. And I'd also say, um, you know, my experience running my own teams, people, people react really well to vulnerability from their leaders as well, and actually opening up a little bit about what's going on for you. Um, it, you know, goes down pretty well. But in terms of how we can support, it would be the same. You know, you, you've got digital access through uh, Silver Cloud. You can call us up and just talk to us. Um, alternatively, if it's a family-related issue, we've got the family uh, support line as well. Let's turn our attention back to, which I think are really important, which is the legal risks. And so coming back to Joe, so managing the legal risks in a met relating to mental health in a workplace is really important. And, you know, what are the, what are the key things you think an employer should consider? So the number one thing to remember is that health and safety law uh, governs mental health and health and safety trumps pretty much every other law there is, which is why you'll see 
things that happened during COVID were done under health and safety law to, to wipe out anything else that might have been in the way. And that brings with it liability for an employer, not only in civil law, so through tribunals or county court claims, but criminal law as well. So it's something to take really seriously. Um, health and safety trumps everything, and you need to be aware of that. You also need to be aware that it, it doesn't only matter that someone's working in the office and you've done a risk assessment there. If their workplace is at home, the hybrid model, or during COVID people of home working, that's still your liability. So ways to think about how to manage risk in someone's home working environment, again, that's the employee's responsibility. And I'd encourage all employees to, to get some good advice and some employers to get some good advice on how to manage that risk. I don't think many small businesses realise that the law, uh, we're both lawyers, so it takes at least the law 50 years to catch up. But in this case, because of the pace of change, yeah. the law is not far behind what's actually happening in the workplace, is it? That's absolutely right. And the thing that alarms me, I think, is how many um, small business leaders don't know until it comes to bite them. And I, and I talk about the law biting, and, and in these cases it really does, because it, mental health and health and safety to your employees is taken extremely seriously. And the financial implications for business are, are extreme. Which brings me on to my next question neatly. So mm. in your experience, have you seen examples of situations where a business hasn't managed employee mental health properly? I have, um, and, and they are frequent now, much more than they were before. But, but I can think of one that I'm dealing with right now, uh, a case of a, an employee who uh, had stress and depression and took some time off work. Now, there wasn't a formal process in place, wasn't a formal policy in his small business, but his boss said, look, take the time you want, very informally. But when that time got to about six weeks, the boss had kind of changed his mind. But he didn't have the policy to hang the framework on of what to do. And everybody was getting quite desperate for this guy to come back and started to ring him and say, can you just help me with this? I know you're off sick, but can you just help me with this? And it made him worse. They had an occupational health assessment um, of this, this guy, and he said he needs clear time away to recover from the things that have happened to him. Uh, and they, they still had to keep bringing him. They still felt the need to keep bringing him. In the end, he, he was constructively dismissed. He resigned and claimed constructive dismissal. Uh, the employer was, was liable for a small fortune. Uh, but also, the reputation of that employer is down the drain because they'll know, in the kind of business they're in, that, uh, that words travel and, and the employer was, was pretty much held up to be a, a bad one at that time. And it's always, these things are always complicated, but if they'd had policy, procedure, and thought about it beforehand, it would have been a better position, I guess. Exactly, because the policy would have said, this is what you can do, this is what you can't do, and the procedure would have said, these are the people to speak to if you're not sure. It's always a good idea to have someone who's key in the business who takes responsibility for this, uh, and, and they didn't have that. One of my suggestions would be someone like a mental health champion, for example, but in terms of what managers need to do, managers need to know how to manage the risk. It's fraught with potholes for employers uh, and, and it's something they need to know the risks of. So what are the, the three things that a small business should think about in terms of managing their mental health related risk? Uh, the first thing is take proper advice. Don't draft something yourself or get something off the shelf. Employment law changes every year on the 6th of April, so always get proper advice. The second thing I think is mitigate your risk. So look around, see how you can manage risk amongst your employees. How do you do a risk assessment when someone's working at home? It's perfectly possible, just needs a bit of thought. And the third one is communication. Keep talking to your employees, keep talking to your staff. Make sure that people know what's going on and know what's what, and, and they know that they can speak to you about issues they're, that they're having. And make sure they know where the policies and procedures are as well. Absolutely, yeah, in a staff handbook, ideally, and that everybody's given that staff handbook. And in their contract or offer of employment letter, you draw their attention to the staff handbook and ask them to read it and sign something to say they've read it. That gives you some legal protection to say, look, we've fulfilled our duty to some extent. You've just got to keep communicating with your staff. So now the moment you've been waiting for, we're going to answer some of your questions. We've had a huge amount, so thanks for sending those in. And if we don't get to all of them, please go and look on Bupa's LinkedIn or the, the Bupa website, and we'll try and share some more answers to the top questions. So I'm going to go to Joe first, uh, the first question's for you. In your experience, who is the best person in a small business to oversee the risk side of health and wellbeing? So usually the head of HR. Um, HR, uh, in people are trained in, in how the law works in employment law. They also have good links with employment lawyers. And if you don't have an HR department because you're a small business? 
I would say then the CEO, because with health and safety and mental health of, of your employees, the buck stops with them. Okay, and over to you next, Dr. Naomi. Next question here for you. How do we support an immune suppressed colleague back into the office after a, such, you know, such a long time away? I think I'm going to come at this from a purely mental health and psychological perspective here. So from my point of view, it would be to recognise how they may feel after being away out of the office for so long. So just really validating that, you know, the lifestyles changed, including their habits with regards to work. So they're doing things very differently now. Also, the vulnerabilities have been heightened naturally with everything that's happened. So really just putting that out there and recognising that with that person so that then they feel they're being heard and listened to about this whole process. I would say collaboration is very important with the person, so going over any of the concerns that they've got, any of the queries they've got about that return to work, what that might look like for them thinking about their motivation to return to the office as well and whether there's any positives in that about you know how valuable it is to be in the workplace actually you know have they considered their best day in work and what that looked like and why it was so good before they had to go um, working from home I would think about um, probably a gradual and phased approach to the whole situation so that you just take it one step at a time with that person so they gradually get used to that environment bit by bit and checking in with them at each time to make sure that they're comfortable with it and have like time frames within each step. And then finally, if there is any psychological distress associated with any of that, depending on the level of it, signposting them to the relevant people so that they can get that help. Great, very full uh, answer to that question there. Richard, one for you, um, something close to my heart, data. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Yeah. So can Bupa provide metrics around mental health claims so that we can keep in touch with how our team are doing as a whole? So yes, there are a couple of things that we can do. Um, firstly, for employers, we can show the data that we have across our whole population. Um, so that can help as a guide in terms of what they should be expecting and what's good and what's, what's less good and so on. Secondly, for larger businesses, um, we can share some uh, anonymous data um, based on their employee group. Um, they do need to be a certain size though um, because we need to protect people's um, personal medical data so we want them to be able to um, identify any employee in that but where they're big enough and we feel we can offer that information then, then we absolutely will, yeah. Great, thank you. And one for you Joe. Um, what would you say the main risks are when managing a small team's health and well-being? Not getting it right, not having a robust approach and not taking the right advice and having the right policy in place. If you just leave it, if you're a group of people who know each other and you're a startup, you're a small group, and you think things won't go wrong, so you just leave it and you'll have an agreement that's like a gentleman's agreement, it's not going to work. You do need something written down, you need that framework in place. So don't wing it. Don't wing it. No, yeah, okay. it's not worth it. The, the, the trouble that you'll get yourselves into is, is so significant, it's really not worth it. Another one for you, Dr. Naomi. Do you have ideas about promoting psychological safety? I would say psychological safety is very, very important at the moment. It is about the culture of the workforce and it's about making it an explicit priority for the business, linking it to the higher purpose of innovation, team engagement, inclusivity. Thinking about it from a leader perspective or a manager perspective, it's about being curious, asking team members to speak up, to get involved in you know, how we do things around here, really intently listening to what they've got to say, not just the facts, how they feel, how they value things, what are the norms in terms of how we uh, respectfully give reservations about processes and procedures that are going on within the business. Uh, what do we do about failure? What are our norms for handling failure? Do we look at it as a growth exercise where we can actually all reflect together and get better at things? Um, what are we doing about creating innovation? So is it about one expert within the whole company or is it about we've all got expertise in something, so let's bring it all together? And that's why it's really so important to have such an open and honest culture within a workforce. Thanks, Naomi. Rich, another question I think which is um, a really important one actually given where we are and the, the price is rising and small businesses being squeezed. So what can you actually deliver for a small business that's on a budget? Yeah, sure. Actually, there's quite a lot that's um, free and available now. So there's the Bupa Mental Health um, Hub, which you can access for free. Um, there are also some other things like the City Mental Health Alliance and Business in the Community, all of which are free resources where you can go and find out some information um, and really sort of start your journey there. 
And Joe, another one, another question for you. Um, goes back to your experience and the, the world is changing. So are you seeing more companies just get this wrong in terms of, you know, and it's beginning to cost them something? Yes, that's absolutely right. Um, I'm seeing more claims come into my desk every day. Uh, and it will cost them a lot of money. At the moment, there's about a year's wait for a tribunal to have findings. But the ones that we saw from the end of the second lockdown are coming through now. Uh, and tribunals are taking the side of the claimants. They're, they're supporting the employees who didn't want to go back to work because they were unwell. Uh, and the employers are, are taking quite a hit for that. Thank you, Joe. That's nearly it from us today. Uh, it's been really important and interesting, I think, if you're a small business owner to you know, understand the, the challenges around you know, finding talent and retaining talent and how thinking about mental health can help you do both of those things. And as we've been going through this conversation with the panel here, I made a couple of notes of things, I think the, the key points. And I think that those are, if you're, if you're an employer, especially a small business, is you need to think about this. You need to organise, have a plan, uh, think about procedures, but Basically, you need to have a strategy, a structure, a way of approaching this and having those policies and procedures in place as soon as possible before something happens, not afterwards, because then it's just too late. I think the second thing that came out for me was that, and I've experienced this myself quite recently with a member of one of my teams in my business, is about encouraging open communication. Talking about this is just not easy. Um, it may be not easy for you as the business owner or the CEO. So think about yourself as well as your team as well. But to do that, you've got to, and Dr. Naomi touched upon this, you've got to build a culture where people feel as though they can have this conversation, that they're supported, they can reach out. And if they can't, the resources or people they can call or email, people they can go to to discuss their mental health. And that really leads into making it easy for people to get help. There's no point having an issue and talking about it if there isn't a, a solution to it and somewhere for them to go. So, you know, you need to work with a company like Bupa that provides those resources and those solutions for you. And the, and the last thing for me is a legal risk. I'm an ex-lawyer, can't help but listen to what Joe's been saying about you need to understand your legal risk and have these policies and procedures in place Make sure they're in your contracts, people understand them, they've been referred to them, so that when it comes to it, and you're, you're in a tribunal perhaps, um, you have gone through the, the process and you've managed and limited your risk. Thanks for joining us today in the Bupa Academy. I hope you found it useful. And please do look out for the survey and participate, get involved. We're really interested in seeing your feedback. And we hope to see you next time.